what's different about milk, cheese, or yogurt we drink today versus 100 years ago? So both dairies and feedlots have cattle, but there's mixtures. So for example, um, one of the ways that a modern dairy uh, operates is that it wants to keep the cows producing milk as long as possible. Well, just like humans, cows produce milk when they're pregnant and after they're pregnant, right? And so they keep impregnating the cows so that they'll keep producing milk. Well, something's got to be done with all those calves. So they sell them to feedlots and fatten them up and, sell, and get turned into beef. But anyway, for a person drinking milk or eating yogurt or ice cream, I think it's really important to know how the modern dairy differs from the dairies of old. I live next door to Wisconsin, dairy capital of the world, or at least it used to be. Uh, in the past year, about almost 800 Wisconsin dairies have gone out of business. The, the policies are not paying those dairies enough to pay, cover their cost of production. So literally, they're better off giving away the milk than selling it to consumers. And you can't continue doing that for very long until your business starts shutting down. Uh, the uh, trade dispute that's going on hasn't helped matters. One of the ways dairy is kept in business was to sell the dried protein, dairy protein, to China and other places. Because of the trade disputes going on, that market's been really diminished now, so the dairies are going out of business. What we're left with is huge corporate dairies, um, not only in Wisconsin, but for a long time in places like the Central Valley of California. And these dairies keep getting bigger, and the um, pollution that they produce keeps getting worse. Uh, they suck up an enormous amount of water, so in our great wisdom we put them in places like the Central Valley of California where there's not enough water and, you know, it's really hot. And uh, so somehow that's where we put the biggest dairies. What's the time frame for serious failure of antibiotics? That's a very good question. I would say that the time frame, we don't know exactly what the time frame is. But um, the fact that we've already got at least 23,000 people a year dying from antibiotics failing uh, means that we're already there uh, and it's going to get worse. The question is, how bad is it going to get? And right now, there's because we keep overusing antibiotics to such an extent, um, there's really no limit on how bad it could get before we basically stop doing many of the things that we've come to expect from modern medicine. So, hey, I've got walking pneumonia. I should get an antibiotic. Uh, used to be we could count on there being one that would work before we die or end up in the hospital. Maybe not true in five or ten years. We do know that this uh, epidemic is getting worse quickly. So there's two categories of these last resort antibiotics, and I'll just talk about one uh, called colistin. It's a polymyxin antibiotic. It turns out that it's been hugely used in China, in pig farms, other kinds of agriculture production. They use it quite a bit in Europe, too. Well, uh, a thinking person would say, gee, if we have a last resort drug, that we only use when everything else fails, maybe not a good idea to use on farms. And yet, that's what has been going on. So a couple of years ago, um, for the first time, they found on pig farms in China a particular kind of resistance forming to colistin. Uh, it's called transmissible resistance. And what that means is that it's resistance that sits on a gene, a particular kind of gene, that travels very easily from one bacteria to the other. And not only that, but it's the kind of gene that can very easily get paired up with resistance to the other last resort antibiotic. So if the last step in this whole sad process is if the resistance to both those drugs end up on the same 
strand of DNA, and that strand of DNA travels you know, from a China to the US, then we very quickly have people dying in large numbers, and there's nothing that we can do to treat them. What problems are we seeing from the overuse of antibiotics? Listen, that this whole issue boils down to one simple equation, and that is the more we use antibiotics, the quicker we're going to hasten resistance to those drugs to develop and spread, uh, which means people are going to start getting sicker and antibiotics are going to be less effective for things that we need them. So um, the end result of that is sicker people, more hospitalization, uh, more deaths, uh, vastly increased costs. I mean, really, our, our entire healthcare system is already sitting on a precipice where, you know, there's any number of things that can kind of drive the whole thing into bankruptcy. This might be the biggest one because it's so expensive to treat these infections and they're coming down the pike in such huge numbers that unless we do something drastically, I think it could torpedo the whole healthcare system. Has anyone come up with something we can do drastically yeah. to change this? Uh, th there's one very uh, good thing we can do if we had the right leadership, and that would be to set a hard target for how much we want to reduce antibiotic use in livestock and by when. So I'll give you an example. In the Netherlands, a few years ago, I think it was 2012 or 13, they said we want to reduce antibiotic use on our farms by 50% in four years. They did it in like three years. I mean, it, it, it can, it, it's ripe for the picking. All it needs is somebody with some authority saying, we're gonna do this and we're gonna figure out how to do it. And in my work, I've talked a lot with veterinarians and microbiologists and doctors in Denmark and the Netherlands. And they said the big difference we see between our countries and yours is not the farms, the farms are basically the same. The difference is that in our country, we believe that we can all come together and figure a problem out and do something, and in yours, you don't.